What's up, guys? Welcome back to That Spooky Life. I am your host, Miranda, and I am happy that you are here. I hope you guys are enjoying the new year and the new changes that we've been doing on the podcast, having a good time with myself. Hopefully, you guys are enjoying it as well. Always let me know in the comments. If you are a longtime listener of the show on Spotify, Apple Casts, Anchor FM, whatever it is that you're listening, I appreciate all of you. It's you guys have kept me going and you are the heart and soul of this podcast. And I appreciate all of your stories. And every time that you guys make a request or tell me something you enjoyed about the podcast, it is the best. If you are joining us on YouTube, hi, it's nice to see you sort of, you can see me. And I'm also happy that you guys are here. Whatever your platform is, I am glad that you have decided to join us today for some spooky stories. So with that being said, we'll dive right into the first one. And the story that I have for you from my personal experience today actually happened recently. There was a situation where a young woman and her mother had been having some paranormal experiences in their home. So Spooky Squad member Diana of Abernathy Books gave Kevin and I a call and asked if we were available to come see maybe what was going on. She had some impressions, but she wanted a second opinion. And they had questions about some stones that the young lady had been given. So that's more Kevin's expertise. And of course, I'm familiar with stones and usage, etc. Of course, we agreed. There was a there was a family in need and they were kind of getting freaked out because what had sort of just been things falling off in the shower, ooky spooky feels here and there had potentially escalated to where the mother, Jamie, had fallen down the stairs and she felt like she had been pushed. While it was good that she ended up going to the doctor because there had been another health related issue revealed in so doing, she was now a little freaked out about what was going on in the house. In addition, the teenage daughter, Addie, had been hearing voices, sounds, and seeing shadows move, and I believe they said it was around Thanksgiving that she had woken up with scratches on her body. So we tried our best to go in with no assumptions, clear head, clear mind, etc. Initially, we'd been asked about our opinions on the matter, and having heard everything that was going on, I knew that there wasn't going to be a way to determine the truth of it until we actually saw it. Like, it was going to require us to go there and see exactly what it felt like, what we experienced, because there are far too many causes, mundane or otherwise. You know, a mischief spirit can push you just as much as a, the word that we try to avoid here being demon. A malicious demon spirit or a mischievous spirit can equally push someone down the stairs, but the energy feels very different between the two. We made plans to go over to their house, meet Diana there, and take a look and see what we could find out. So upon arrival, it was very interesting. The property in which they live is actually a series of townhouses that are 10 to 12 townhouses in a row and a series of, I want to say there were four or five buildings. No, there were six. And the parking lot, the property itself, is bisected by a little runoff stream that has like a footbridge over it. And there's also a bridge over it on the main main road. But on one side, I had been informed that there was a very nice lady who was an active practitioner. So someone who is aware of energy, sages, keeps things clean. I'm not sure what her exact path is, so I am hesitant to say witchcraft, obviously, because it could be anything. But there was a practitioner there who had done a house blessing for someone else, and she lived on one side of the complex. Upon arrival and parking and sort of hearing the stories, we went into the office to meet Diana and found that there were some, there were some interesting energies there. There seemed to be a young spirit of some sort that was very curious and darted away when she realized that Kevin and I could notice her. So that was tick number one on the checklist. At first, Kevin and I decided to do a walk of the property before we went into any individual houses to get sort of a baseline. That way, if there was any residual energetic anomalies that were just inherent to the location itself, and just affecting them inside their home, we would feel these things outside. And as we were doing so, we started on, we'll call it the left-hand side. And it was, there was a, a, 
a gravity to the air and the energy there. It was charged, was probably what most people would consider to feel like negative energy. It wasn't terribly negative. It was just very charged in my perceptions. We walked down in between the buildings, things like that. There didn't seem to be a whole lot, but when we reached the end, I thought I saw a person standing at the corner and looked up because I was going to do the polite Southern thing. I was going to wave and say, oh, hi, neighbor, you know, don't think anything about the psychic vampire walking around the property trying to figure out if it's haunted or not. Have a nice day. Bye. Not None of that. I looked up and there was something peeking around the edge of the building, but it was not corporeal. It was not tangible. And when I looked up and noticed it, it darted away. I was like, hmm. Okay. So I kept a feeler sort of out towards this entity and we proceeded to the right hand side of the property. And let me tell you, when you cross that footbridge, the air changes entirely. That is the side of the property on which the practitioner lived. It was not very surprising to feel that there was a huge energetic difference. In fact, when I made a guess energetically, I, I said out loud, but based on the energy of the area, I made a guess as to which one was the practitioner's house. Diana started laughing because it was not the practitioner's house, but it was in fact the one that she had blessed recently. And I was like, oh, okay, well, that's why it feels so good. There was, however, an interesting spot on the right-hand side of the property where in between the buildings, there was just a knot, like a K-N-O-T of electrical wires and electrical boxes and things like that. Walking in between those buildings had the stereotypical heavy feeling in your chest. For Kevin, it gives him a migraine. For me, it makes me nauseous. That some people, some people also feel in a haunted building, but has a very tangible physical explanation. And we were like, oh, well, I could see people being freaked out if they walk between this because I don't want to stand here anymore. It's making me sick. Come to find out when we told Diana about this, apparently that's also where the cable wires run underground. Like there is a hub there. So in between those two buildings on the right hand side feel real ooky spooky. But in reality, it's just electrical energy. First possible spooky thing checked off as mundane. So after this, we go to meet Jamie and Addie. Addie was not home. She had decided to run an errand to some friends' houses, and Jamie invited us in, welcomed us graciously. Wonderful, charming lady. Their house is beautiful. And initially, upon walking in, I didn't feel anything. They had a beautiful home that had moving energy. It seemed that someone there was aware with a capital A, or potentially sensitive, because there was a really good vibe to the downstairs area of the house. So we talked to Jamie for a minute and got some of her experiences. Of course, this was all stuff that she'd told Diana, but hearing it from her definitely hit differently. So we explained to her the kinds of things that we do. I am mostly energetic and I have practice and experience in some witchier practices. And Kevin comes from a place of intuition and similar things. So we told her what we were wanting to do, where we were going to do a walkthrough first, and we would start on different floors and then switch, at which point, once we were both done, we would compare notes and see what was going on. So we do our walkthroughs, and my experience was, honestly, something was going on there, but it did not seem targeted. It did not seem like a personal haunting. It did not seem like something had been sent to them or anything like that. Let me back up. I forgot something. When we were outside, the little thing that had darted behind the building did not seem malicious, did not seem evil, wasn't any sort of demon. I don't think it was anything that had ever been human, but it seemed very mischievous. And as we had slowly walked away from it, I poked at it and said, what are you? And it gave the vibe of like a giggle or a chuckle. And then it showed me in my mind's eye how it would hop in and out of houses. And it was kind of like a weird, empty, gremlin-y Santa Claus in that way. He was very proud of the fact that he could jump in and out of the houses through the, through the roofs. And I wasn't sure, like it was a very specific imagery, down into the house from the roof and back up through the roof and into the next one. And I got the sense that he had claimed the territory as his own. There was a very strong sense of, of ownership from the spirit 
as if this was his territory. This was his. Okay. Going into Jamie's house, I assumed nothing. And finally, I realized I was like, there's not, there's not a spirit here. There's not a ghost here. She had been wondering if, you know, an ancestor spirit was there and displeased or something. But I didn't sense any, any ghosts. Not in the traditional sense. So I sat down in Addie's room because that was where the most charged energy was. I felt her edge of fear and concern and she had her stones and it was very clearly the most energetically active room in the house. I sat down and I closed my eyes and I centered and I grounded and I said, okay, what's going on here? And lo and behold, the little mischief spirit heralded my call and impressed upon my mind, wow, if she wants to be scared, I can scare her. And I paused and I thought about it and I realized, oh, I know what's going on here. Once Kevin was done with his part of the walkthrough, we had discovered two things on his end. Something that I had noticed one of them, I had not noticed the second. The stairs in that house are not only very narrow stairs, not narrow like shoulder to shoulder, but like narrow for your foot to be placed on. They're very short stairs. They are also slightly angled downward. Apparently, while I had noticed the poor construction of the stairs, I had not been down them since I walked up. I started on the ground floor, Kevin started upstairs. So when we traded, he went downstairs and I went up. So I had not been down the stairs at that time. Apparently going down the stairs, Kevin had tripped and almost fallen and had that feeling of catching himself that felt like he'd been pushed. But he realized that it was because the stairs were too narrow and angled downward and that can create that feeling of being pushed when you try to catch yourself. Additionally, the room in the house that most people feel disoriented and have a, a woozy sense, it seems the floor was uneven. It doesn't look uneven. If you're standing and looking into the room, you cannot tell anything. However, if you roll something, or if you do a couple of tests like Kevin did, you can find the floor is uneven, which creates the funhouse effect. Now, anybody familiar with the paranormal is probably familiar with the funhouse effect. It's very disorienting and can be very subtle. When we go to explain this to Jamie, she actually knew the funhouse effect, and we came to find out that she has an interest in the paranormal. So this was a pretty easy conversation to have, which was great. The other thing that this brought to light was I told her the impressions that I got about the spirit saying to me, well, if she wants to be scared. And I said that I felt as though the interest and curiosity about the paranormal was scary when you get something back. But what was causing it was the interest in it from Addie. Jamie didn't seem surprised by this. I said, I don't think she's doing it maliciously. And I don't think there's anything here that's going to harm you. This thing's just mischievous and likes feeding on fear. As we're having this conversation in Addie's room, Addie gets back and we decide to posse up and go downstairs. But I explain the imagery that I was given about him hopping in and out of the roofs. And then we look up and notice that the attic access is in Addie's room. It was a nice little bit of validation that I was like, oh, okay. So we walked through all of this with Addie and Jamie. They were very receptive to it, very open to it, and we let them tell us about their experiences so that we could validate these things. Jamie was actually very happy to know that the stairs and the weird funhouse feeling up in the bedroom were mundane causes, that there wasn't something trying to mess with them, and that it was just legitimately things to be careful of, but nothing trying to get them. After that, we offered them an energetic and smoke cleansing of the house and told them that as long as they continued to keep the energy flowing and taught them how to shield and things like that, that there shouldn't be any problem. I'm working on following up to let you guys know what the follow-up is. I think there are a couple of things on the show at this point that I need to follow up on. So we're probably going to do a follow-up episode very soon and we'll see how Jamie and Addie are doing. But all in all, spooky experience though it may have been, it had a pleasant resolution and I was very happy that we could find some reasonable explanations for a family that had previously been really freaked out. So that is my spooky story for the week. Which brings us to our listener story for the week and I am happy to continue the Chronicles of Cupid. As you may know if you have watched on YouTube before, I apologize, I am going to be 
looking down quite often so that I can read the story that was sent in, but we're going to get right to it. Cupid writes, I go hiking. Like a lot. A lot, a lot. I've had many experiences in the forest of being watched or being generally creeped out by a presence in certain areas. There's so much wildlife out on the trail that it's difficult to discern if I'm getting that feeling from an incorporeal entity or if it's a primeval instinct to sense the gaze of a predator like a bobcat or a bear. Either way, when it happens, I try to carry myself like a healthy, capable person just in case I can make a predator think twice before pouncing me. So far, that has worked. One fall evening, my husband and I decided at the last minute to head out to the trail for an hour or two before dusk. We take the winding roads past pastures and crop fields where protective farmers sometimes drive by to see if we are a friend or foe and parked on a familiar trailhead out past an abandoned homestead on a dirt road with spotty cell signal. We both grew up rural, so we are comfortable in remote places, especially since this trail and trailhead are considered part of the National Forest Recreation Trail. That means free for public use, so we're good. It was hunting season, so we donned our orange vests and trekked out. Keeping an eye on the sun as we went, we made our return trip with plenty of light to spare. When we got into the car to start home, we made it up the dirt road past the lake and homestead and finally on to where the road was paved again. There was a little narrow pasture fenced between the road and the tree line. The forest was losing most of its undergrowth by now, and the trees were all browns and orange. I was looking out of the passenger window, admiring the scene. The sun was sinking in to golden hour, washing everything in honey-colored light. Something in the tree line caught my eye. There was a man standing just beyond the far side barbed wire, his head swiveling, watching the car as we drove by. Except the strange thing about this man was that it looked like he was in a full-on fursuit, mask and everything. What really struck me was his eyes. And let me tell you, because I was not expecting to see a hairy man, all I could think about was how skilled the artist was that had created the mask, because the hair was expertly rooted, with light browns ringing the eyes, blending into the darker fur of the face. And I thought to myself, I would never wear a mask that handsomely crafted in the woods in fear it would get ruined. Because, you know, where I live, people do a lot of cosplay, but don't usually have naturally hairy faces. In my excitement on seeing such a sight, I leaned forward, pointed, and said to my husband, Look at that man standing there in that fursuit. When I did, old dude crouched down low, his eyes still on mine as we rode out of view. What man? The man standing on the tree line. He was wearing some sort of fursuit. It was wild. Mm, probably a hunter. No, his mask had fur on it, too. Why would a hunter wear a fur mask? How did he fit it around his eyes so well? Oh my god, I think I just saw a Bigfoot. Husband does a turn around at the next crossroads and said, I have to go back and see this. Reasonably, as anyone would, in my opinion. But when we went back, it was gone. My husband had me tell this story to his Bigfoot hunter buddy. I'm still not sure what exactly I saw, but I will never forget those eyes. Cupid. So you saw a Bigfoot or a werewolf or something. That's, that's a first on me. I have never actually seen anything that I would consider a, a, an actual cryptid. I've seen things take the shape of that. There's a story from when I was like three that I thought there was a werewolf standing over my bed. But in retrospect, it was really just a shadow person. But I've never actually seen anything physical with my physical eyes that I would have thought was Bigfoot or a cryptid. So, well played to you, friend. That is, that is a first for me, and I love these stories. Just because I've never seen one doesn't mean I'm not incredibly interested in them. If you ever want to go out and look for it, hit your girl up. And that is our listener story for the week. Which brings us to our witchy tip. And our witchy tip for the day, I have titled, You Get What You Give. And I... We've talked about some of this before. I know that there are practitioners out there who live their life by the law of three, which is whatever you put out, you get back three times. So if you put out good, you get back good three times. If you put out bad, you get back bad for three times. And I know that there are particular traditions and studies that don't believe in it at all. 
However, and I've talked about energy like attracting like, it's all very ephemeral, ethereal. Some people psychologically can explain things away. They go, oh, well, no, that's not how that works, so on and so forth. But I, here at the beginning of 2021, the thing that I just want to touch on, the thing that I want to share with you is the world has changed in some very tangible ways. And I'm not going to go into the full quote of Lord of the Rings, but I would really like to. I feel it in the air, etc. And regardless of what you believe, regardless of whether or not you believe in the law of threefold, regardless of whether or not you believe that it's one for one equivalent exchange, or if you believe it doesn't matter, there's something that does matter, in my opinion. And this is just my opinion. But the world needs a little more kindness, a little more understanding, a little less inaction of good men. But what it also needs is some more understanding. And there are a lot of people out there right now who are having a very hard time. And that comes in about a thousand different flavors of what that hard time might look like. So when you read something or see something that gets you fired up and you feel betrayed and you're having a hard time dealing, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be something that you can just do off the cuff. But I know I personally, currently, am trying to be as understanding as possible, within reason. Nothing that crosses boundaries, nothing that makes anyone a doormat or anything like that. But the idea of you get what you give is the idea of compassion. And I would encourage people as the months come on and we see what 2021 has for us in store, good or bad as that may be, that we still try and go forward with compassion because I know I will be because I would like to receive compassion in return in the event that I'm the one who needs a little patience. Now you might be like, oh wow, why is that a witchy tip? Well, maybe it's not. But it was something that I felt was worth restating and sharing for our new listeners if you haven't necessarily caught up on all the old episodes and haven't heard me sing this tune a time or two. It's not necessarily do unto others as you would have done unto you. It is more along the lines of try to be compassionate because you don't know what else somebody has going on. And while you may not be able to change their belief, you may be able to make them think and you may inspire them to have a better day, which may make them less hateful, less caustic, less abrasive tomorrow, which then might engender some thoughts. I won't dwell on it too long. It's just things to think about. In any event, that brings us to the end. If you have a spooky story that you would like to share with the podcast and have me read, to all of the lovely spooky people, please send it to that spooky life podcast at gmail.com. If you are a fan of social media, we're on, we, me, I am on Instagram at that spooky life podcast. I've also recently started sharing condensed versions of my spooky stories on TikTok as at vampire ant spooky if you're a TikToker. And I am uploading episodes now to YouTube, as I mentioned earlier. So thank you for joining me. And until next week, my darling friends, do not forget to keep living that spooky life until we talk again. Bye.